Bill Brock, uh, and I'm just going to premise him. This is a man who researches Bigfoot. Yeah. So I searched for Bigfoot, and recently, uh, Les Stroud had an encounter. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but it was in Alaska. Um, we don't really know if he saw it for sure, but from what I've heard, he didn't actually see it. But I'd really right. like to know more about that. And mm -hmm. also, if you actually spent some time where you heard this thing mm -hmm. to find any other kind of additional evidence, such as prints mm -hmm. or you know, feces or whatever yeah. could have been left. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one other quick question. I kind of consider myself a, a very novice filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And you know, I do a lot of stuff on YouTube, yeah. and it's difficult sometimes to go into the field and have a beginning, middle, and end to your videos. Yeah. Do you know of a, a, a way, like a bulletproof way, you can kind of think about this before you go into the field? to make sure you keep that storyline? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know if you heard that, but it was, a, it was a little bit more of an expansion on my Bigfoot experience. And then it was a filmmaking question about how in the field to maintain a, a really good story arc of begin, beginning, middle, and end. And I'll start with that question. Um, it is definitely a big part. I mean, the reason why I put the camera on the cliff and walk away and walk through the scene and go back get the camera, climb back down, check the camera, oh, I missed it, I cut off my head, gotta do it again. The reason I do that is because I'm very passionate about the art of what I do. I might be just making shelters, but in my mind, I've always considered myself, hopefully, even if mediocre, an artist. That's what I feel I'm doing out there, is creating art and a beautiful story. I'm a storyteller, so I'm creating a beautiful story. It just so happens I'm really living it. But I do, the, so that you're blending actuality of what's just happening, with a story. So the story arc is so vital. It's, it's so important to, to recognize that, as I tell you, my story about surviving in uh, the Georgian swamps, there does need to be a beginning, middle, and end. And I can tell you for sure that, for me, there's always a high point. You know, when I snared the rabbit in the Tomogamy airplane air cr uh, crash episode, that was like, I got my film, because I have a high point. I have a beautiful peak, because I, I know that's a powerful moment. And, and it was also very palpable, my excitement over doing that. So that's, so then everything else can flow around that, you know, and, and create the story. Um, all I can tell you is that um, I do have to have a bit of guidance for myself. So I've got seven days, let's say. And I know I'm going to do the hand drill on this one. I know I can weave a bed. I know I can eat scorpions. I know I can gather a pincushion. Cactuses, I'm just thinking about Arizona right now. So what I will do is I will kind of lay that out on a piece of paper, which by the end of the week is filthy and dirty and all crumpled up. But if I don't, by day three and day four, with exhaustion and lack of food, I can't think straight anymore. And I know that I, I'll be like, what was I going to do? What was I going to do? And I can't think. So I just pull out the paper. Oh, yeah. Pin cushion cherry. Okay. And I'll go and find a cactus and I'll show this because I have to remind myself of the story that I want to tell while I'm going through it. Um, so I do give myself notes. And when I go out in the Bigfoot situation, I will think about, I've got so much experience in the bush, I will think of all the things that could happen. And I'll think, okay, are there things that I can um, um, make happen so that it happens and I can show it? Are there things that I know will happen anyway and I want to, I have to deal with it? What, what's going to happen when the rain comes pouring down? Oh, crap, I'm going to have to make a shelter. All those things. And I, and I might lay them out on one little crappy piece of paper and shove it in my pocket and, and head out. So um, as much as it's pure actuality going on, it's also a little bit of planned actuality to make sure stuff happens. Um, because the truth and reality of survival is, for the most part, you could just sit there and do nothing for seven days, you know, um, which would be very boring. Bigfoot. So um, there I was. Uh, the short, the first version was in Wabakimi, Ontario, uh, on that year in the bush, and we were in a little shelter area and out by some rapids, some river spot, but we could hear the bush really clean and clear, and in the, and in the dark of night. I heard, basically, only have to imagine that in the duff of the pine needles and the grass. And it sounded like one big bipedal person, man, walking towards the shelter. We were in the middle of nowhere. So when someone straying from a fishing log on, lodge on a hike. And I know what a moose sounds like when it walks, and a bear, and I know bear can follow their own tracks and all that, but this didn't sound anything like that. And what I often do when there's a bear around, and to this day I regret it, because I didn't poke my head out to look, I hollered out, hey, we're over here! And the minute I did that, it just sort of stopped, and then turned around, and just walked away the other way. 
And it sounded like a very big man. In Alaska, many years later, a couple of years ago, shooting Survivor Man, and we've gone back to look at the footage, and the hairs went up on the back of my neck. I forgot. I was going through a, a um, sorry for the young folks here, I was going through a nasty divorce at the time, and I was very distracted by a lot of things. And someone asked me recently, like, what did you think about all that Bigfoot experience? And I was like, you know what? I buried it. I just put it, I didn't even think about it until a couple of years ago, and I, Opie and Anthony asked me to tell the story, and I'm, oh yeah, yeah, Bigfoot. So I tell the story, next thing I know, it's all flushing, running back to me, like, wow, I think I kind of buried it during a very busy period of my life. And what happened was, I was, uh, we looked at the footage now, and I see myself on camera, you know, going, And then back to doing my scene six, seven times. And I'm sitting with the editor going, oh, that's right, I totally forgot I did that. I was being distracted by something big in the bush. I'm thinking grizzly. And um, naturally, it's in Alaska, but there's grizzly in the area. So at some point I'm, I, I, uh, in Survivor Man, I will make my grass mat, and then I have to actually stop uh, all the filming of making the grass mat and actually finish making it. Um, sometimes I might put a time lapse, sometimes not. So I do have to really survive and turn the cameras off. So this was one of those moments I finally turned the cameras off, cameras over there, and I'm filming myself, and then I just hear this big crash crack in the bush, and I just froze. And I'm thinking, when's the grizzly coming out of the bush? That's all I'm thinking. And I'm looking over there, and the camera's over there, and I'm looking back there at the kayak, and I'm thinking, you know, can I get to the kayak? Can I get to the camera? And I froze there for a while, but then I heard, Way, way louder than that. Five more times. Really, like, it would fill this whole room. And the hair went up on the back of my neck, and I just froze. I'm so used to working and being around wild animals. I've been sniffed by lynx and chased up a tree by a moose and chased by elk and all this. That I know that, you know, if I, I let my freeze, I just wait. It's like, okay. <laughs> and um, five more times, really loud. And then the minute I went, I thought, I keep looking over my camera. I gotta do this. And then finally, I make a move to get, and as soon as I make a move, I hear this smash, crash, bang, smash. And off it went. And I, as I said, I know what a bear sounds like when it grunts, you know, barks, black bear or grizzly. You know, and I know what a moose sounds like when it moans and snorts. This only sounded to me like the great apes that I've heard on television. That's what it sounded like. That's all I can say. I went down there. I, you, I know you're wondering this. I did go down to check. And don't ask me why. And, and um, it was so swampy down in there, I couldn't get. And then we're talking 50 yards away, by the way. Basically, at the doors is where it was. And so, uh, if, I don't know how long it was, but that's where it was. So I went down to check, and it was too swampy, I couldn't get, but it made me double think, as of recently, I had seen lots of scat around there. Now, it was big scat, and, and to be fair, those who have claimed they have found Sasquatch scat, if you look at it, it does look a lot like bear scat. There, it can be very similar. And I just, my head said, where's the bear scat? And I, and I pointed out on the camera, look, there's lots of bear activity here. And all these, these plops of scat. As I think back, and you know, hindsight and everything, it's like, wait a minute. You know, it's like, wow. You know, was it? Or I don't know. So, uh, and I've had, you know, um, different big, uh, re, uh, Bigfoot researchers, Todd Stanning, show me, you know, scat they've collected that they've done DNA on and all this stuff. Looks, and it looked like what I saw. So the, the way to finish this part of the topic off is to say this. Is you can ask the question two ways. I remain a skeptic although I've had my experiences. But you can ask the question two ways. You can say, do you believe in Bigfoot? That's one question to ask. Very tough one to answer without going, well, I don't know. You know? Or you can say, well, just like the giant squid, or the silicon fish, or the skunk ape, who are all considered myths or extinct, do you think it's possible then that tiny little remote pockets of a bipedal ape, possibly Gigantopithecus, could exist around the world spread out in tiny in remote areas that's very intuitive, very sensitive to human beings, very intelligent, likely uh, buries its dead in caves, which they have two caves full of Gigantopithecus bones, 
um, and is responsible for thousands of anecdotal references, including sightings, rock throwing, scats, uh, club hitting, all the sort of different things, vocalizations. That's a different question to ask. Then you have to look at it scientifically. And all of the scientists that actually allow themselves to get into it and don't mock it at first will come back and say, there's so much evidence now, including DNA, that, DNA, that if you don't at least accept the possibility, there's something wrong with your sense of logic. Um, so, but I go in as a skeptic, and I'm literally going to go in as a skeptic and see what happens. Uh, and uh, one personal slice for Bill's benefit, I will say this, is I do think that if, on the remote possibility, such a creature should possibly exist, um, I have no interest in going in and begging me one. I think this is something that, if that's the case, serious protection, serious wilderness protection, serious geographical protection uh, needs to be put in place. Serious scientists doing serious research uh, to really find, you know, figure out. That's on the, the, the side that if potentially, possibly, might exist. But let's try and let's hopefully, hopefully we find out the right way. Not somebody goes, beg me one! And it shows up, you know, stuffed in a casino in, in Las Vegas or something. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, 